Hey guys, and welcome to the first. And uh, let me turn off some something. There we go. I think this is a lot better. Okay, there we go. Welcome to the first Q&A for Digital Classroom Live. Now, what is Digital Classroom Live? You know that every month we do a live shoot from our studio. And that live shoot is actually done really live, meaning, well, it's live. You see what we do, right? Now, we always did this for three hours and we found out that a lot of people had problems following the full three hours because let's be honest, three hours is a long time to sit behind your computer. Now, of course, we record this and you can watch it back. And I know you guys do that a lot, but still three hours is a long time. So we discussed this and we brought it back to two hours. So the next digital classroom will actually be two hours. And don't worry, you will still get the same information. But in return, during the month, we'll do these smaller digital classroom lives. It's just me in the studio. As you can see now, things can go wrong. For example, we still had the audio on from our amplifier. So we got some feedback here. Great for Guitar Hero, but not so great for education. And those episodes will be short or slightly longer, depending on what we do. Now I'm alone in the studio, so I have to do everything myself. Now I want to explain to you guys first what we're going to do today. It's a simple Q&A. You send me in some questions and we're actually going to answer those questions online. Now, one of the things that you probably would have remembered is I asked you the questions a few days ago and we tried to broadcast. The software we used didn't work at all. So we switched to new software called Wirecast and let's hope that this works flawlessly. And I hope it works. <laughs> so otherwise we'll have a problem and we'll have to switch software again. But I have a very good confidence that this will work. So behind me, you can see actually my computers. You can see the live stream up there. And on this monitor, I actually have Wirecast running. And in a later episode, I will show you some stuff about Wirecast, which is pretty interesting. So let's start about the questions. Now, the first question I got in was, how about color space? Now, color space is one of the things that a lot of people ask because it's very confusing, right? You have your monitor calibration, you have your settings for your printer, you have your settings for, well, everything has a setting. Now, Color management is actually called something ICC profiling. Now, ICC profiling is the profile that's created for a certain device. So let's say you have a monitor. In my case, I have a BenQ 27-inch monitor here, and I calibrate that monitor. Then I get an ICC profiling. That profile I use, and I get the correct colors from my monitor. Now, that's easy, right? But how do you set it in Photoshop? Some people will use the same profile for the monitor in Photoshop, and that's wrong. Photoshop, um, well, let me, let me boil it down to three. Uses sRGB, Adobe RGB, or Profoto RGB. Now, see it as this. sRGB is a really small color space. It means it's great for internet use or sometimes to print something, but it's a small color space. Adobe RGB is a slightly bigger color space, actually a lot bigger. And Profoto RGB, that's a really big color space. Now, if you shoot RAW, most cameras capture more data than the Adobe RGB. So that's why in my workflow during seminars and webinars, you actually see that I'm working in a Profoto RGB color space. Now, I hear you asking, and this was one of the questions, why should I edit in Profoto RGB if my monitor is Adobe RGB? Well, if you calibrate everything correctly, what you see on the monitor is a rendition of what you will get, meaning, you can pretty well edit on your monitor in Profoto RGB, while the monitor only shows you Adobe RGB. Now, Frank, are there any printers yet that print Profoto RGB, or are there any monitors that will show you Profoto RGB? Why edit in such a big color space? Well, the most important thing for me is I want to get the most out of my files. And you never know what technique will do. Like a few years ago, uh, Adobe RGB monitor was still very expensive. Now BenQ has this 27 inch out and it's only $6.99. So those prices are coming down and technology constantly evolves. I can't tell you when, but at one day you will see a Profoto RGB monitor. Now all the images you did in the past at that time will get new life, new vibrant colors. So why not edit in Profoto RGB? Well, one of the things that is of course, one of the reasons is it takes up a lot of memory space. So you need to store it in a TIFF 16 bits file. Adobe RGB, you can still store, store in 8 bits, but Profoto RGB it really needs 16 bits because, well, if you put it in 8 bits, you get all these weird, weird transition errors and it isn't smooth. 
So how do we store it on our computers? I always store my retouched images on TIFF 16 bits and that takes a lot of space, but I know for sure it's the best way possible. Now, the second question he asked me was, if I make the end result only for internet, should I edit in 8 bits as RGB? Well, my opinion is never ever edit in 8 bits. Because 8 bits is like, uh, you have a few steps and as soon as you start using curves or filters or whatever, those small steps will actually get a little bit less, 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 and you start seeing, for example, bending in smooth transitions. If you edit in 16 bits, you have way much more to work with, so you can push the pixels way better. So my opinion, make sure that you edit in 16 bits, and my personal preference is store it in Profoto RGB. Now, but we talked about ICC profiling, right? So now we know that the monitor has an ICC profile. We know that we edit in a color space, which is actually not an ICC profile, but it's a color space. Now, what do we do when we print? Now, this is where a lot of people go wrong. When you print, of course, you choose the driver for your printer, right? Now, if you're in doubt, you can in Photoshop set it up to, well, let the printer do everything. I personally prefer to let Photoshop do everything. And when you print, the printer driver is already there. The profile you use is for the paper. For example, I love luster paper from Epson, so I will select the profile for that luster paper. Now, what, is your, what if your paper is not in the list? Go to the website of your manufacturer of the paper and you can actually download the ICC profiling. If you can't get any ICC profiling, get something that's close. Do a few test prints. Now, if it all doesn't look right, switch paper. And one of the things that I love, again, is Luster from Epson. Okay, now another question we got in was actually a very cool one and one we get, lost, get asked a lot. How do you mix big strobes, so studio strobes, with small flash speed lights? The solution is very simple, guys. If you use the Allengrom system, and I don't know if there are other brands out there that do it, but in Allengrom it's very easy to do. You can learn your strobes to see the pre-flash from a small flash. So what you could do is you can shoot ETTL, but of course the, the studio strobes will never do ETTL, of course, because they will actually be on manual. You shoot ETTL with your small flash, and the pre-flash will go off, and at that time the Allengrom's won't respond yet. And then the big flash goes off from your speed light, and the Allengrom's will be triggered by those via the optical slave. So you can combine them in that way. If you have a system that doesn't have that pre-flash recognition, what you can actually do is put your strobes all on manual, and this is what I actually advise everybody. Don't trust ETTL, always shoot manual mode. Now, if you shoot your strobes on manual mode, you can actually trigger your studio strobes by the optical slaves. You can also do it the other way around. Now, how can you trigger a speed light with, for example, an Allengrom, Profoto, or Bron, or whatever? Well, there are little hot shoe converters on the market which has an optical slave inside. And via a small cable, you go to your speed light, and at that point, as soon as it sees a big bulb of light, it will actually go off and trigger your small strobe. So, if you prefer to shoot with big strobes and just add small strobes, you can use that converter. If you prefer to shoot speed lights and you want to trigger a bit big strobe, make sure that or you put it on full manual and use the optical slave in the big strobe, or, for example, like the Allengrom system, learn the pre-flash and then it will fire correctly. Okay, so I got some more questions in. Where do you get your inspiration, Frank? Now, I want to show you that on the screen. So I have to turn around and I will actually switch to my screen because, of course, we already prepared this. Go to our local desktop. And let me see. Okay, there we go. Now you can see me and you can see Wirecast, of course. But what I will do is I will get this over here. Okay. And now let me make this a little bit more full screen so you won't see Wirecast in the back. There we go. So what do I use for inspiration? Now, don't look at this if you don't like nudes, because as you can see, there's some nudity in here. David LaChapelle, without any doubt, one of the best photographers, I think, in the world. And I follow him a lot, and I really like his series. And as you can see here, we're on a little bit slow internet, because we're also streaming via satellite. So just look through his series. It's amazing stuff. And whenever I feel like I need some inspiration, I always go back to this. Really, really cool stuff. 
And the other one is a Dutch photographer called Erwin Olaf. And you can actually see some resemblance between David LaChapelle and Erwin Olaf. And both of them are very, very on the edge. Um, again, if you don't like nudity, I think both photographers can be a little bit tricky to watch if you, if you are against nudity. But very, very cool light use. And especially with Erwin Olaf, he has series that are really, really nice to watch. Like Dawn uh, from 2009 that I'm trying to open now. There we go. So, and I just love the expression in the models, as you can see here. It's all like, like David LaChapelle, they will be screaming and shouting and, and that kind of stuff. And here it's more subtle and very, very uh, intimate or, yeah, I don't know the exact term, but it's, it's very nice. Okay, let's go back to the other camera again. Okay, let me do this. And there we go. And now you can see me again. There we go. So now I have to do all the switching myself. Normally we have somebody who helps us with that. Now, the other question that came in was actually, what do you do with backup systems? How do you manage your backup workflow? Because backup is very, very important. Now, I'm going to try something. You see this? This is an iPhone, right? You, you know iPhones, right? And with Wirecast, what we can actually do is we can get the iPhone to talk with Wirecast. So let's see if that works at the moment. So... Let me see if we get a live picture. And of course, when I'm live, nobody, nothing works. Ah, there we go. We transition. Okay, so what you can see here on the floor, and there's a slight delay, is our main backup system. I see a lot of drives, you see a lot of labels. And what it actually is, is it's an Adonix tower and every one of those bays have normal hard drives. So it's not a NAS system. And it's connected via ASATA, so it's a very quick connection to our computer. And the main advantage is speed. Another advantage is if I need to replace one drive, I only have to take out one drive. Now the backup system, and let's walk a little bit, that's actually over here. And that's a Synology NAS. And the Synology is actually connected to a UPC. And that makes sure that if we have a power outage, that it will actually take over the power. Now, of course, if you have a backup system, you also need something to backup with, right? So I'm going to show you that now in a moment. So let me click this stuff away so I can share my screen with you guys. Uh, let me see. We go into carbon copy and I'm going to share my screen with you. So again, I'm doing this all by myself. So it will be a little bit less nice as you're used to with digital classroom. But I think it's okay, you know. Okay, now you can see that we have Carbon Copy Cloner on. Now, Carbon Copy Cloner is a software package that actually makes it possible to create recipes, in this case, for example, retouched backup to NAS or NAS Anavik or unworked backup to NAS, uh, um, the rest, <laughs> scans, video, video, video. And the fun thing about this one is it actually makes incremental backups. Now, what does it mean? Incremental backups means actually, let me switch to this so you can, guys can see me talk. There we go. This is our Logitech webcam and it's still a little bit bright, but we're working on that. So what is an incremental backup? An incremental backup actually means that you only copy the files that have been changed. Now, a lot of people go like, oh, that's interesting. So I never have to worry again. Uh, yes or no. If you look here, you can actually see that we have something called safety net. Now you can do safety net on or off or don't delete anything. I always use don't delete anything and I can tell you why. And this is a real true story. I almost lost a lot of data. By accident, I deleted a folder on my hard drive, actually on my retouched hard drive. I made the backup and in my opinion, everything was nice and dandy, right? We made a backup, we're safe. Then after two or three weeks, I actually found out that I deleted one of the folders of retouched images. And I was going like, hmm, where's that folder? Well, let me look on my backup. Yeah, because it was an incremental backup, the backup actually thought, well, you deleted this folder on purpose, let's delete it from the backup. And this is where Apple Time Machine really shines. I don't have in Time Machine, of course, my retouched images and my raw images, because then Time Machine would be huge, but I still always shoot tethered 
on an SSD drive, and that SSD drive is in Time Machine. So at one point, of course, it will be too big and Time Machine will start deleting files, but they were still there. I had to go two weeks back, but luckily I could get all my files back. So after that, I always said, don't delete anything. And if I delete something, I will do it manually and then sync again. Now, the nice thing about Carbon Copy Cloner is that you don't have to do one, 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 every time you have to select one, like a lot of software. In Carbon Copy Cloner, I can actually start this one, start this one, start that one, start that one, start that one. I just start them all. And at that time, you can just take a cup of coffee or do whatever you want to do, and you come back and everything is nice and dandy backed up. So it runs simultaneously all your backup uh, needs. Okay, let me go back to this one. Okay. So this was our first time that we did the Q&A for Digital Classroom Live. And as you can see, because I'm doing it myself, it's less smooth, some things go wrong, there's a little bit of a delay in between. And the next time we'll actually do it with one of our interns who um, remotely controls all cameras. But this is actually a test. We're now streaming via satellite. We're using Wirecast for the first time. It's recording on the hard drive in a higher resolution. So we just want to see how the software works. So if this is still online tomorrow, <laughs> it worked. It worked. If it's not online tomorrow, well, you never missed it, right? Or you must have watched it live today. So thank you so very much for watching, and we'll see you next time on a new digital classroom. And of course, we have the live shoot with Lena coming up, and that's going to be really interesting. So see you later in Digital Classroom Live.